Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk mainly about the effects of GM crops in the field, but I'm going to make a few general remarks first. The first point I would make is that if anybody in this room is really afraid of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, they should leave because each one of us has over a hundred transgenes in our genome and uh, I think therefore we're all genetically modified organisms so you wouldn't want to eat products derived from us, I guess. Werner Arbor, our president, has contributed a great deal to our understanding of the fact that genes moving laterally, as it said, from one kind of organism to another are very, very common in nature. Amborella, which is the flowering plant with the most uh, uh, archaic characteristics, which happens to be an endemic on the island of New Caledonia, has at least 50 transgenes from four different phyla in its, in its genome, and uh, that's just an example of this process, which is a perfectly natural part of the adaptive system in nature. If you recognize, as people have for a very long time, that DNA is the genetic instructions for uh, transcribing proteins through RNA that make up the constituency of cells, uh, then you can understand that putting another gene into the middle of that somewhere, provided that it resides there and is set there, is more or less equivalent. This is an overstatement, but it's more or less equivalent to introducing a few more chords into a musical score. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it'll be eliminated. And there's nothing really unusual about the way that it changes the basic instructions. Um, if you put on top of the fact that we're all GMOs, uh, we ate a lot of GMOs at lunch, the cheese, the bread. Most of the medicines we take are GMOs anymore, insulin and so forth, derived from GMOs. Nobody worries about that, or beer, or the fact that papaya is all genetically modified because it couldn't survive without it. And if you really think that GMOs are going to do something bad to us, consider the fact that uh, hundreds of millions of people and billions of farm animals in the United States have been consuming products from GMOs for over 15 years, and there's not been a single case reported of a sick or otherwise disturbed human being or a sick or otherwise disturbed animal. And if that doesn't show you something, I don't know whatever, uh, whatever would show you something. Now, obviously, you can use transgenes just like you can use any other kind of genetic process to produce plants which are dangerous or poisonous. You can but you can produce poisonous tomatoes. They were poisonous in the first place by conventional breeding. You can produce poisonous squash by conventional breeding. You can, you can do anything. You can produce weeds by conventional breeding. You can do anything you want. And GMOs are no more threatening than is any other kind of agricultural regime in producing these bad results. Now, the key point I want to make, and the one that I hope you'll really carry away is, each transgene is different. Each time you make a GMO, you take some kind of a gene and you put it into some position in some other organism, usually a eukaryotic organism, and the donor may either be eukaryotic or prokaryotic. The next transgene will have another gene, probably a different one, from another kind of organism, and it'll be put in the instructions of another kind of organism. Now, if you have a theory that can explain why a series of those would have something in common that would make them dangerous as a class, I'd love to hear it. It's scientifically impossible to imagine that all the transgenic events that are carried out to produce all the GMOs in the world lead to any one, any, anything. that They lead to no substance of any kind. There's nothing in foods derived from GMOs. There's nothing in GMOs that's in common with other GMOs unless they're the same origin. And so why people can be afraid of GMOs, I don't know. And as to that stupid article in the New York Times, can you imagine, let me, let me just point out two things. The man wrote an article in the New York Times saying GMOs are not really living up to their uh, promise. Well, first of all, I hope you gathered from what I already said that it's wrong to deal with GMOs as a class. There are a whole series of different genetic modifications 
of a whole series of different modified other organisms, and they're not a class, they're not something that does something or something that scares you or something that's gonna make you sick. They're as different as plants produced by any other method. It would be as logical to say no double recessive crosses have been involved in the origin of this food that you're eating. Uh, as it is to say no trans genes are involved in it. it makes exactly as much sense and it's exactly as dangerous. Now this guy wrote this article in the New York Times that said uh, they're not more productive. They, with, first of all, there is no they. What are they? There are certain kinds of corn, there are certain kinds of soybeans. And then I'll tell you one other thing. 95% of the corn planted in the United States, the maize, is GM. 95% of the soybeans planted in the United States are GM. 95% of the cotton planted in the United States are GM. 100% of the cotton planted in India is GM and it's increased yields many fold. Now, are those farmers really stupid enough? I mean, are farmers really so colossally stupid that they would be planting 95% of their crops in GM crops if they weren't more productive under their conditions? That article is insane. There is no way you could support the hypothesis that 95% of farmers would be growing them unless they were getting something from growing them. More productivity, less disease, fewer aflatoxins in the case of corn or whatever. Farmers are, are not stupid. They're smart people and they're in it to make money. There are about 280,000 industrial scale farms in the United States. And believe me, those people are, are uh, up to the minute in their knowledge of what to grow and why to grow it. And then for the New York Times to come out and say, well, it doesn't really do anything. Well, I mean, goodness gracious, that would be like putting out an article saying, cell phones are useless. Uh, they really don't communicate, you know what I mean? How does GM affect biological diversity, which is the main subject that I want to touch on today? Well, let me start by saying that agriculture is the major enemy of biodiversity. There's no bigger enemy of biodiversity in the world than agriculture. Agriculture has 11% of the Earth's land surface in crops and another 20% of the Earth's land surface in grazing, which is mostly on natural pasture and mostly unimproved natural pasture that's failing as it's being grazed. The one-third of the Earth's land surface uh, involved there is a huge proportion of the Earth's land surface. Now consider Mediterranean Europe, which has scarcely any natural vegetation in it except on rock faces and rocky cliffs. It's all heavily modified. Don't you suppose that agriculture did a lot of damage to the biodiversity of Mediterranean Europe? Of course it did. It had to. Think about it. Over the last 10,000 years in which we've been growing from 1 million people to 7.4 million people and expanding our agriculture in an effort to feed them all, we've destroyed a huge amount of the fabric of the living world. How do you cut back on that? You cut back on that by being as sustainably productive as possible in the land that you have under cultivation so that you don't have to have loose, uh, uh, miscellaneous, disorganized cultivation going through everything and killing off as much as they can everywhere. Obviously, a highly cultivated large-scale field uh, is not a place where a lot of biodiversity is hiding. But if that field is highly productive, if it feeds a lot of people, a lot of biodiversity will be surviving somewhere else. And if you had to get the same amount of production you did in that field, uh, by, uh, by, say, old-style agriculture, the kind of thing that people glory in, you know, oh, we ought to go back to the old days and have small clearings in the forest and grow it all organically and have one cow. And If you did it that way, you'd be a lot more damaging to the living world because you'd be everywhere. Not that you can do it that way. Should large-scale agriculture be used everywhere? Obviously not. Small-scale agriculture is good some places. Perennial agriculture is good some places. 
We haven't yet done the work to be able to assert that some kinds of agriculture are generally more productive than other kinds of agriculture. For people to talk about whether organic or industrial agriculture is more productive is a total waste of time because the experiment will never be the same in any two localities. Some places you want to use highly productive crop agriculture on an industrial scale. Some places you want to use small agriculture. Uh, GM is independent of scale. Everybody thinks GM kills things off because of this huge field. GM doesn't have anything to do with huge fields. I mean, sure, manufacturers trying to make money are making products that they hope will be used in huge fields. But if you get down to the actual biodiversity of the crops themselves, there are about 450 kinds of genetic varieties of soybeans grown in the United States right now. And you might say, are they all, those all being smirched into one? No, each one of them has been modified genetically, and each one of them grows better in a particular place. If you have a small organic farm, you could benefit from agriculture if we hadn't been nutty enough to rule that GM was non-organic. That leaves us with the situation where you can take Bacillus thuringiensis Bt toxin, put it in a freezer, uh, spray out hundreds of tons of it all over the environment, kill off every kind of insect in the groups you're doing, and that's organic because it comes from a bacterium. But you can't engineer the plant so that it produces that poison, and then that poison kills only the insects that are trying to eat it. That's non-organic. Go figure. I mean, what are we trying to do? There are a lot of people making an awful lot of money out of non-GMO claims, and that's the, the organic industry as it grows in Europe and the United States is putting an awful lot of money into saying you can get non-GM. We have a chain of stores in the United States called Whole Foods, and that chain of stores, the fastest growing part of its uh, income is from non-GM crops, uh, non-GM food rather. Well. Since there's nothing in that non-GM food and since they're simultaneously selling cheeses and beers and a lot of other things with GM organisms at the root of it, what are we talking about here? It's a fraud, basically. You can't get any benefit from eating non-GM food because there's nothing in GM food. There's absolutely nothing that's repetitively in GM food. So what are you saving yourself and your children from? I guess having some extra money to go to the movies with. Now, there's an idea that growing GM plants may produce weeds. <clears throat> um, certainly they could, but we have about 20,000 kinds of weeds in the world. I only know one kind of weed that's produced by a cross between a cultivated plant and a wild plant, and that's a sorghum halepensi Johnson grass, which is produced by a cross between cultivated sorghum and a wild relative grass. It has absolutely nothing to do with GM. Of all the, the 20,000 plus weeds in the world, not one known to me has been produced by GM. Have they been produced by systems involving GM plants that that involves spraying them with a certain kind of herbicide like glyphosate and it was modified. Sure, but that's just a wrong use. That's a wrong use of the system. That's not thinking carefully enough about the system in the first part. It's the agricultural system. It has nothing to do with the intrinsic properties of how the individual plant was produced. Um, did we have herbicide resistance before we had GMs? You bet we did. As soon as we started spraying a lot of herbicide on crops after World War II when chemicals and pesticides and things became prevalent, then, uh, then uh, we began having weeds. We began having things that were resistant to them. Uh, plants hybridize. Plants like maize have been improved by hybridizing with their wild relatives as they've been, as they've been developed. They grow among, in southern Mexico, they grow with teosinte, with which they hybridize. When early in the 20th century, people began bringing in so-called improved corn, which was hybrid corn and other kinds of corn, 
they hybridized with them and the properties of the corn that people were growing in southern Mexico were improved. If a kind of corn got a gene that made it resistant to an herbicide, so what? If it went wild, first of all, corn never naturalizes. Secondly, if it went wild, what would be the consequence? Uh, with Norman Borlaug and Perry Gustafson, I wrote an article that chronicled about 15 kinds of plant breeding that we're using, which include GM. Uh, all of them are modern things that we've developed. We've been doing plant selection for 10,000 years. We've been doing serious plant breeding in terms of selecting results for about 200 years. These are some methods that we've developed now that are helping us to be more productive. They are what we've come to in our progression of beneficial ways of improving and dealing with the characteristics of the crops we grow. The growth of the world population by three times during my lifetime demands enormous production of food. It doesn't allow us the luxury of not using certain genetic methods because people make up silly stories about what they think and fear that they can make money on in some way. For Europeans, for example, to be anti-GM when there's nothing in GM that they could be anti and no danger that they're running by eating it and then denying the use of more productive crops to people in Africa who seriously need them to improve their cassava, their yams, their bananas, and so forth, I would hold is straight immoral. And I think if people thought it through, they would understand that that's immoral. Naturally, in Europe or America, we can afford to be highly selective, but people around the world need the best, most dependable, and cleanest productivity that they can get. And we shouldn't be so arrogant in our wealth and in our selfishness to deny it to them. Other than that, I have no real feelings on the subject, so I'll... <laughs>